everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Medical Responder Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. Also, I want to make sure that you know that we are trying to get the non-gory and not too graphic stories in this video. However, due to the nature of some of the stories in this video, viewer discretion is advised. And now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. In the 1990s, a nurse in New Jersey killed hundreds of hospital patients. Sometimes he would sneak into patients' room at night and inject them with fatal medication doses. Other times he would put the medication into IV bags in the supply room so they would kill whatever random patient they were given to later. He was accused several times. Some patients pointed him out before they died. Some staff thought he was creepy and dangerous and refused to work with him. He kept getting fired from hospitals, but the hospital managers knew that if he got arrested, they would be sued by the families of the patients he murdered. So they just fired him and didn't call the police. That happened at 12 different hospitals over the course of 16 years. Investigators believe that he killed as many as 400 people. After he was arrested, he confessed to 40 murders. In 29 of them, he gave enough detail to be charged and plead guilty. He is linked to 300 plus more deaths than that, but details of those will probably never be known because so much information was lost over time or destroyed by the hospitals. While I was on life support, there was this other girl on a ventilator just down the hall. Like me, she'd had all of the right symptoms, headaches upon waking, vomiting without nausea, and getting lost in the house where she'd lived for years. Like me, she researched them extensively. Unlike me, she reached the right conclusion and asked her parents for a scan, but they had a bunch of other kids and money was tight and she was at the right age to see symptoms as unduly catastrophic. So they said no. Meanwhile, I was treating my symptoms with the gym. My mother had begged me to get a scan and I'd said no. Until I had health insurance of my own, I couldn't afford it, as it would show a pre-existing condition that would destroy my future insurability. The other patient took up three jobs to save the money for a scan. She made the rounds of several neurologists, begging. Each responded dismissively. She was too young and looked so well that she had to be hypochondriac. Finally, one took pity on her and gave her a scan, telling her outright that it was only so that she'd stop asking and that she'd hear results in some weeks. I kept going to the gym until the day that I collapsed, vomiting blood, bursting a pupil. She went in for her first craniotomy, walking, talking, fine. My parents and boyfriend would sit beside me through my coma, holding my hand, telling me how much they loved me. She'd have her own such trio doing the same. I'd awaken. I'd meet her parents, her boyfriend. I'd visit the ICU. I'd see them growing more gaunt, more desperate each time until the trip when I learned that she'd gone into long-term coma care. I'd recover. She'd die. Brain cancer is that kind of a jerk. Since then, I've taken the survivor's guilt to do everything that I can with my life. But that so easily could've, should've been her outcome instead. That's the outcome for so many. It's terrifying because it demonstrates how we as a society 
often dismiss the health complaints of all but a narrow slice of the population without even registering what we're doing. How many lives do we, unthinkingly, throw away? My father had his spine severely fractured in an assault when I was an infant. He had a real jerk of a doctor that was super dismissive of him. One day he was at an appointment and she left the room, at which point he took a peek at his chart. She'd recorded him as a hypochondriac. She'd never examined him. He was so furious that when she came back, he ripped his button up open, turned around, and demanded to know if that looked like hypochondria. For the record, a zero of his spine was rotated almost 90 degrees by the assault, and it was very visible. It's a miracle that he regained the ability to walk at all. Mom says that the doctor went pale and ran out of the room, never to be seen by them again. The sheer arrogance of some doctors infuriates me beyond words. At work, we had a patient who was referred for a spinal scan just so he'd shut up. His general practitioner was trying to wean him off of his pain meds, but the patient was fighting this tooth and nail. It was clear from the referral that the doc thought that he was a drug seeker and wanted to shut him down. The first radiologist looks at the scan, sees nothing wrong, but his spidey senses are tingling, so he dumped the case in my lap and refused to do it because he's terrified that he's going to get sued. I'm not a doctor, I'm an administrator. I spend an entire week basically medically stalking the patient and digging up previous scans from the most obscure locations so that the doctors are satisfied. And then I give it to our best doctor. All that work ended up being unnecessary because the better doctor spotted what the lesser doctor's instincts only hinted at. His spine was riddled with cancer. Bone cancer is one of the most agonizing cancers you can get, and this guy had it all up his back. My just under two-year-old fell down in the kitchen. He had just started talking and five minutes before he fell, he said, I hurt and fell over. We thought he was being silly, but he said it two to four more times. Finally, my wife took him to the kitchen to have a popsicle. It was like 8 a.m., but whatever. She stood him up and he literally fell over. Then he tried to talk again, but it was just baby talk, gibberish. We rushed into the pediatrician. As we were waiting, I noticed that one side of his face was dropping. I said, looks like a stroke. The pediatrician who showed up at some point said, no way, highly unlikely for a one-year-old. They ran tests for what felt like days, but was probably more like 10 minutes. I kept saying his left arm is dropping now, and his face is fully stroked out. Finally, my wife stood up with him in her arms and yells, screw this, I'm driving him to the children's hospital. The pediatrician kept telling us to go to a different hospital because he had admitting permission or whatever. They also tried to get us to take an ambulance, but said it would take about 15 minutes. We ran out, buckled him into his seat, and drove like a race car driver to the children's. They took him in, and there was immediately like 40 doctors in the room. They ran all kinds of tests in seconds. Guess what? Stroke. He was having a hemorrhagic stroke from a burst capillary in his brainstem. He was dying, like for real. If we had stayed at the pediatrician's, he would have died. It was terrifying. Those ER doctors at Children's Hospital saved his life. They were brilliant. I barely remember the day, but at some point, the doctors at the Children's asked questions like, was he struck? Did you hit him? Etc. 
We realized later that they were attempting to discern if we caused it by hitting him in the head. The burst capillary was actually so deep, a hit on the head wouldn't have caused it, per his neurologist. We spent nearly three months inpatient, including a harrowing week in the NICU. He worked really hard at walking, mostly thanks to the musicians who got to the hospital to play for the kids. Every time they were there, he wanted to dance and he did a ton of work every week just to be able to dance when they played live music. Fast forward, he is eight and healthy as an ox. He has dropped foot and a very weak left hand, but he is so good. Many of the outcomes that were possible were much, much, much worse than his slightly weak left hand and slight drop foot. The neurologist told us one time that they were fairly confident that he was going to be left-handed because of where the stroke happened. Apparently, if he had been right-handed, his speech could have been affected much worse. Anyway, that was terrifying. We had a two-month-old baby with us as well. We spent years traveling to and from the children's hospital for therapy and appointments. We just had his last appointment with the neurologist last week. They said, we don't need to see you guys again, which is a good thing. It's not coming back, and his scans all look amazing. One of my friends had a job in the hospital looking after patients, making beds, etc. I heard he randomly quit his job, wouldn't talk to anyone about it. I bring some beers over to his house and try to see if I can get him talking. He's a total emotional wreck. Finally get him to talk, and he says that he was working one night in the hospital when he heard a nurse shouting for help because someone was going into cardiac arrest. So he runs down a hallway, and some man runs toward him. They almost bump into each other, and the man shouts, where's the exit? My friend points to the exit, then runs into the room with the man going into cardiac arrest only to see that it's the exact same person who ran past him in the hallway. He died in front of his eyes. In the mid-90s, my mom and I lived in Malaysia while my dad was in the UK studying for his medical exams. I was a toddler, so I don't remember many details of our home, but photos tell me it was idyllic and backed onto a forest which proved a popular playground for the local kids. As it was just my mum and me, she often had to get my babysitter to look after me while she was working at the hospital. I recall rather liking my babysitter, and by all accounts, she was very fond of me. However, she was only a teenager at the time, so she also had other responsibilities, and at that point, I'd proved myself a bit of a scamp as I was a woman about town on my trike zooming around in the forest with the other kids. This is why my mom would sometimes ask the hospital creche to care for me so she could pop in a few times a day. I believe this is where my mom met her friend. Mom's friend was a doctor at the same hospital. They had both emigrated from India at similar times and they bonded over this experience. According to mom, she seemed nice if not a bit overzealous when venting about her ex. She took a shine to me as she had children back home of a similar age, so she'd often come over for a cup of tea chat and bounce me on her lap. A few months down the line, her demeanor started to change. The previously flippant but forgivable behavior began to deteriorate. She was beyond simply being tardy and eccentric. It was alarming. One afternoon, she came to chat with my mom over a cup of coffee and everything seemed perfectly pleasant. After a while, she gazed at my mum with a beaming smile. She said she had something to show her, and that it meant a lot to her. It was deeply personal, but she felt like she could trust mum, so she wanted to share it with her. She reached into her handbag and showed my mum a small box. When she opened the box, my mum couldn't quite understand what she was seeing, but then it dawned on her. It was a vertebra, a single human vertebra. The bone had belonged to her late mother, 
with whom she was very close. She went on to explain how her mother was the only person to have not betrayed her, and that she finds herself falling victim to despicable men. My mom could feel that she was becoming increasingly intense and agitated as the conversation progressed, and eventually it went south with her condemning her ex for abandoning her in a foreign country. She was spitting, her voice rash from screaming about him and how he deserves a slow death. It was at this point my mom decided that was enough and tried to calm her down and saying her goodbyes. Mom's friend didn't turn up for work the next day or any day after that. According to the secretaries, she had just gone AWOL. It wasn't until a few years later that my mom had realized what happened. By 2001, we were back with my dad and settled in the UK. Mum often keeps in touch with the friends she made during her stints practicing medicine abroad. And on one such day 20 years ago, she received an email. One of the secretaries she had worked with in Malaysia sent an email containing a link to a newspaper article. It detailed the unfortunate news of a suspected suicide which had taken place locally. A woman fitting the description of Mum's friend had taken her own life from the top of a residential building. It had a picture that bore a striking resemblance, but it was the text that followed making her blood run cold. The article stated that the police in India had been on a manhunt for the woman who they suspect is the deceased. The reason being, she had flown to India five years before and lured her ex to a rendezvous. There, they believe she poisoned him before dismembering his body into small pieces over the course of three hours. The smallest parts were disposed of using a toilet, while the larger body parts were put into a suitcase. She spent the next few days hiring a taxi to visit remote locations, where she would dispose of various body parts. The alarm was only raised when the taxi driver, her final journey, detected the rancid smell of decay emanating from the suitcase. He tipped off the authorities and it resulted in her imprisonment. A few years into her incarceration, the woman jumped bail and fled. The police manhunt resumed, but the trail eventually went cold after it was suspected she fled back to Malaysia. With no further leads, the case went cold. That is, until 2001. For one reason or another, the police have yet to make a conclusive identification on the body of the self unaliving victim. So, while there is every chance that she is the woman who fell, there is also a chance that she isn't. Info. This recollection is based on information provided by my mother and a newspaper article. I would be happy to provide proof of that is what is needed. Thanks for reading. This happened in 1989. I had given birth to my son early in the morning the day before. I'd lost a fair bit of blood, but had been up walking at least once by then, so I wasn't too dopey. My son was sleeping in his bassinet next to my bed. A nurse that I hadn't seen before came into my room and grabbed a hold of one end of the bassinet and started to pull it away. I grabbed the other end and said, what are you doing? She said that she was taking him away for his blood tests. Now, I happened to be a registered nurse, and I knew what sorts of things were done to newborns, and he had already done his tests. I pointed to the band-aid on his heel and said, he's already done his tests, so what sort of tests are you talking about? And she muttered something about not being sure, but there was some test that he needed. I maintained my fast hold on his bassinet and told her to find out what test and then let me know. She went away and never came back. And honestly, I was so out of it that I never even thought to mention it to anyone. But the fact is, several babies had been taken that summer by imposters dressed in uniforms. So I will never know for sure. But I felt like we'd dodged a bullet. I'm a doctor in surgery, and one day, 
I got a case of a man. No big deal. Some cut to sew. I won't give details, but he was around his 30s and had a wound, four stitches on his arm. When I start to clean the wound, strange and creepy compliments had already started. How I got a beautiful doctor. You have beautiful pupils. You are beautiful. You have a nice smell. I just ignored him until he grabbed me by the hips and pulled me to him. I watched him. What the heck? And asked him to take his hands off of me or I'd call security. He laughed and said why I'm dramatizing. I asked him to leave or I was going to report him and then he got up. And he said, You know girls like you shouldn't turn down such offers. Your time is gone. Beauty is transient. I was in shock all day. I told my colleagues about it, and the second time at the checkpoint, my dear colleague took it and warned him. I've never seen him since, and I hope I didn't. I don't speak English, so I wrote this story via Google Translate. So I apologize for any mistakes. I'm a doctor and a 32-year-old single man who spends most of his time in the hospital and the rest is spent pumping iron. That had been pretty much my life till last year. But the pandemic has been kind of an equator-shifting event for us medical professionals. I've seen many of my close associates perish. My mentor. My best friend. That motherly canteen woman whose name I didn't know till her death but who never failed to give my tired face her day-brightening smile. All these wonderful people just died too soon. After two months of corona duty, stress of seeing so many deaths and losing people I knew and worked with weighed me down. It began to get to my head. I began making mistakes in the sanitation protocols, which, even though small, could endanger me and my patient's safety. I told my senior, and requested to be shifted to normal patients ward till I gained my complete composure. She said that the best she could do was shift me to ER, but I'll have to manage routine rounds as well. And I was fine with it. I knew that we were short on doctors. It was a Friday after completing my shift. I was just back to my apartment. I was tired and hungry, but then I was called again. Apparently there was some high profile accident case. She was a girl of 24, only daughter of the local mayor. She had a fractured arm, a bad wound on the elbow which required five stitches. Shards of glass had pierced her shoulder deeply, barely missing the jugular vein. It took me hours to patch her up and head home. A week went by. I kept checking her progress and she was coping well. She was very friendly, but nothing about it made me uncomfortable. I understood since COVID protocols didn't allow visitors to stay. She yearned for someone to talk to. But with each passing day, she grew bolder. Friendliness turned to flirting, which I tried to handle with my best professional smiling face in silence. Soon, her infatuation became a hot topic of canteen discussions and leg pulling, and I began avoiding canteen. It was a normal summer day and I was doing my rounds. I reached her room and, keeping my best stoic face, I began checking for vitals. She said that she was feeling pain in her shoulder. I knew the glass wounds were deep, but so far they had been healing just fine. After telling her that I was going to pull her gown down to have a look, I barely managed to touch it, and she pulled it all the way down to her belly in one tug. I froze. I kept my eyes on the wound. It appeared to be healing normally. I averted my eyes and told her so, but she insisted that I have a closer look. She touched me inappropriately, and I decided it was best to walk out. By the time I reached the door, she said something so vulgar and inappropriate that it made me cringe with disgust. I marched out without turning back. I thought it was best that I told someone before I was accused of something that I did not do. So I told about her advances to my fellow doctor who was of my age and his words were appalling. In the coarsest way possible, he insinuated that if he was me, he would jump at the chance. 
and laughed it off that I was scared of a female. I decided that it was best to go back to COVID duty and stay clear of trouble, and I easily got that. I did not see her and heard she was discharged. I almost forgot about her in the rush of corona patients. A week later, she was admitted with mild COVID symptoms, and her father literally arm-twisted hospital management by holding supplies to provide her with private ward and special care. All of a sudden, she became the most important patient. People were dying in that hospital daily. People whose organs were failing them, whose oxygen saturation was making them struggle for each breath. And we were short to just four doctors. The rest were either infected or quarantined by now. And here, hospital's management was busy providing VIP treatment to an insolent brat. After two days, I had to go check on her. She had a fever. Personal protection equipment kit made it difficult for her to identify me. But as soon as I introduced myself, she had this bizarre smile on her face. She looked unstable with her messy hair, sweaty and sick look. As I reached her, she caught my PPE suit in her hand. Her nails were digging into the polymer, nearly tearing it apart. Shocked, I tried to pull it back but she began rambling stuff amidst her crazy, uncensored yelling. I checked what I had to and pulled out of her hold and exited the room. Later that day, I talked to the management. They took it casually because they had bigger issues at hand like the pandemic and what harm can a sick woman do to a buffed up six foot three guy. Hearing this, I decided that it was time that I left this place, at least for my own mental peace. I resigned and joined another hospital in a different state. More than half a year has passed by, and I still feel like a quitter. I feel frustrated. In all this fiasco, I was asked why I wouldn't want to be with this woman. Asked if I was gay. If I don't want to be intimate with some woman because I don't like her, or because of my professional ethics. It doesn't make me gay. Harassment affects men mentally too. It may not be on the scale that women face, but we're not steel. Men have feelings too. This story comes from a time in my life when I was in a really bad place. I had been misdiagnosed with BPD since I was a teenager, when I was actually bipolar. So, when my first full-on manic episode came along... No one in my family knew what was happening. They thought that I was on some sort of drug or something because I went long enough without treatment that the mania developed into psychosis. I was really, really delusional and sick, like completely out of my mind. So a few of the details here are fuzzy, but I definitely have a very clear memory of this moment. Ever since I was a teenager, I had experienced psychogenic seizures. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a pseudo-seizure caused by extreme distress or anxiety. It's basically how my body reacts in crisis mode, instead of the fight-or-flight instinct in really high-stakes situations. So my parents called an ambulance, since they had never seen me have so many consecutive episodes at a time. And the EMT show up while my brain is pretty much on fire with mental illness. It was the most vulnerable I've ever been. A couple of EMTs put me in the ambulance where two other EMTs were sitting in the back. One of them was really nice to me and tried to do the best he could to soothe me. The other guy was this white, frat-looking dude with a buzz cut and he was just frowning, staring at me and not saying or doing anything. I guess he was more like glaring. Whatever. He was the last thing on my mind. We arrive at the hospital, and the nice guy and the frat guy push me into a holding room in the hospital while one of the others went off into the hospital, I guess to figure out what to do with me. The frat guy finally speaks and says to the nice guy that he can go ahead, he can handle this. The nice guy looked unsure, but he seemed younger and more inexperienced than the fratty EMT, so he just nodded and left. The guy then turned his attention back to me, and I felt eyes shooting daggers at me. He gets up close and grabs my wrists, which caused a huge spike in anxiety, so I started convulsing again. He tightened his grip by a lot, like it left red marks, 
and I tried to tell the first person I saw after this event what he had done, but he insisted that I did it to myself. And who's going to trust the crazy chick, right? But he held my arms down. Then he got all up in my face, and his voice got real low, but really firm and commanding. He said, listen, I know you're faking it. Everybody knows. You aren't doing your parents any favors by causing a scene. So just stop it. Stop it. I literally felt his spit on my face. I didn't know what to do, so I screamed. You need to work on your bedside manner as loud as I could. And shortly after, a nurse and my dad came in, and the guy backed up and speed walked out. I remember someone at the door trying to stop him, but he just kind of shouldered him off and stormed away like he was angry or something. I never saw him again after that. I had a few more freaky experiences at the hospital psych ward, but that was the one that I remember most vividly. About a month ago, I started working in a nursing home near where I live. I gotta say, it's not a bad job if strong smells and putrid sights don't bother you. The residents here are usually sweet and lovable, although there is rude, grumpy people here as well. Who can really blame them, though? They don't have many years left, and many of them don't get visitors anymore. It fulfills me to talk with them and give them someone to talk to since their families are no longer around. All was going well here with this job, until they put me in the dementia wing. I always knew that I'd have to work this wing. They bounce me around the floors, pretty much wherever they need me. At first, it was just another normal day. Put together my cart and clean the floor. However, after I came back from the first 15-minute break, I started getting very unsettled. I'm not sure what caused this trigger, but if I had to guess, it was because I was too tired to really take in how creepy this side of the facility is. The rooms are strewn about almost randomly, as if they were trying to pack in as many people in here as possible. The residents here are often gray and gloomy, missing hair and teeth. I walked along the crowded halls, cleaning room by room, really taking in these people's lives and trying to piece together some story. What unnerved me more was the rooms without a lot of possessions. As if someone simply said, they're so far gone, why would they need a lot of stuff? Broken clocks that no longer work, or were set to a very wrong time, as if to really pound into my head the most of these men and women have no concept of time anymore. The overhead lights that drone on the rectangular boxes that house a remainder of the back rooms in a vague sense. This reminder was greatly heightened in the residents' bathrooms, where the buzzing was harsher, louder, and more vivid. I turned off, I don't know how many lights in these bathrooms to ease myself a bit more. The walls were a pinkish tan collar. This was the biggest reminder yet. For some reason, the collar seemed to fit, perfectly with the unsettling atmosphere. The staff was even creepy in a sense. The way they weren't put off by it, even seemed joyful, made me feel more out of place here. I wanted to go home this day. I'm not a weak-minded person by any means, but something about the atmosphere was making me incredibly uncomfortable, like I was a ghost walking through these halls. Now there's only about 10 to 15 rooms left. I pulled my cart into a big open alcove in the hallway where most of the residents were sitting in wheelchairs, as none of them had the strength to walk anymore, staring mindlessly at a TV playing cute videos of animals, assuming Lita put the residents at ease. However, this one thing that made me feel comfort quickly turned to dread. It was off-putting this was the one good aspect of the wing of the nursing home, as if it didn't belong on the television. Their eyes... They looked at me with such sorrow, as if to say help me, without saying anything at all. I'm not really sure how many of them can actually speak. Some of them look at me and ask, where am I? And I'm at a loss as what to do. 
because I don't know how to answer in a way that they'll understand. Then, the screaming, the cries for help, the yelling for anyone to come comfort them, yelling out blood-curdling screams when the nurses remotely touch them in any way. I just have to watch as I'm just a janitor who cleans their rooms. No, their homes. And I'm not allowed to touch the patients. No way to give comfort other than words. When they can barely hear, let alone process what I'm saying. This wing is so incredibly unnerving and sad. Listening and watching all of this does remind me of a piece of art known as Everywhere at the End of Time. And I feel as if this experience is only more unnerving, having prior knowledge to this sad piece of art. The worst part of it all is this could easily be any one of us when we get old, not knowing what is real and what isn't, and crying out for loved ones who aren't there and will never come. I'm an EMT basic for a private ambulance company in the Midwest. For this call, it was my turn to do paperwork and sit in the back with the patient. We were called to take this elderly woman from the hospital ER back to her nursing home after she had a medical issue earlier in the day. The time was around 7.40ish, and we arrived to the ER room. She was in, and she just lays there, facing straight up, not moving, eyes wide open staring at the ceiling. We ask the RN if this is her typical mental status slash behavior, and they say yes, and go on to explain that she suffers from advanced dementia and generalized muscle weakness. They say that she is unaware of anything happening around her, and that isn't directly physically affecting her, and she sometimes just mumbles to herself, never acknowledging anyone or anything in the room. One of the hospital techs had to go in and change slash clean our patient up, before transport, and she got a little agitated from it, but as the RN disclosed, she never acknowledged anyone's existence and just babbled on a bit more rapidly, which continued for the rest of the night in our care. We got her over to our stretcher, buckled her in, and once we were in the ambulance, we started transporting. Inside the ambulance, I kept it dark, since she was staring blankly up at the ambulance dome lights not wanting to hurt her eyes. The only light that I had was the laptop with our EPCR, patient care report. And from the little EMT light next to the captain's chair for doing paperwork or small tasks. With these small lights on, I could see her face pretty well as she just babbled on and on, talking about nonsensical things to people that did not exist, non-stop staring at the ceiling once I had finished with my final set of vitals en route and put it in the laptop, I shut the screen down and placed it on the shelf next to my cell. I'm sitting in the captain's chair at the head of the stretcher, facing backwards towards the doors. And before I turn the EMT light off, I notice my patient staring directly into my eyes, not muttering a word. I move my head to the right and left a little bit to see if she was just fixated in this direction maybe from the noise of the laptop closing, but she followed my head's movements, never breaking eye contact. Intrigued, but not really phased by this, I turned off the EMT light. I can just barely see her eyes and face in the dark, and they are still entirely focused on my face. She then spoke directly to me, just one sentence. The angels are calling for you. As she points at me with one hand, with no expression on her face other than a blank stare. She stares on for a couple of seconds more, before looking back up at the ceiling once more, and just mumbling random stuff again to things that aren't there. The rest of the transport and drop-off procedures went on with no other incidents. I know it was probably just another visual disturbance to her, but man was it super creepy, and it will forever stick with me.
I am and have been a paramedic for about 10 years. My entire career has been spent in emergency medicine, responding to 911 calls and providing advanced life support for life-threatening illness and injuries. The calls we respond to range from inappropriate use of an ambulance to minutes away from death, and oftentimes it's already too late. If you've read my other stories here, then you know the background. But in 2014, I moved to another city a couple of hours away from home to work. The city was smallish, less than 100,000 people, but the ambulance serviced the entire county where the city resides. At the time, there was a significant oil boom in the area, so thousands of people flooded the city and county to work in the oil fields nearby. This caused the city to get a little rougher, as you had people from all over the country moving there to work, and that many people in a small place increased the cost of living and we saw a large increase in violent crimes as well as traumatic injuries. We worked 24-hour shifts, which weren't too bad. The days were usually somewhat busy, and at night the ambulance station had rooms with twin beds that allowed you to get some fairly decent sleep at night. Most of the calls that would classify as crazy, creepy, or scary always tend to come at night. The day that this story takes place was a little different than normal, Normally, I get an EMT basic partner, which means, since I'm an advanced provider on the truck, I get all of the patients. But today, I had another paramedic partner, because we were training in a new hire paramedic. It was her first day in field training orientation. This means that we generally let her take the calls, and set back and evaluate her performance to ensure that she is capable and doesn't kill anyone. This was her first job after graduation so she was still pretty green. I could see that she was very nervous and trying very hard to do her best. So as per usual, the day was pretty busy, but as it began to wind down, I was getting ready to attempt to take a nap. I kick off my boots and lay down on the bed, on top of the covers, easier to get up and going that way if a call comes in. I put my radio up to my head, full volume like always, so I can be sure to wake up if we get a call. Sure enough, midnight starts to roll around and I hear a call go out. Dispatch says, man who has been stabbed to death is not breathing. Luckily, it's not my call, and another ambulance responds. So I go back to bed, or at least try to. About 30 minutes later, another call goes out, and this time it is for me. Dispatch information, man with a knife wound on his hands, Police are on scene. I get my boots on, wake up the new girl and my partner, and walk out to the ambulance. The rest of the call was right smack dab in the middle of downtown. We responded non-emergent, as it was not a life-threatening injury. As we arrive on scene, there's probably six police cars on scene, all with their lights on. The area itself was through an alleyway and behind a building just off the main street. As we pull up, there are a number of officers, a couple of sheriff's deputies, and a detective all standing around this man with a rag on his hand. As I got closer, I could see that the man was bald, middle-aged, and had almost a homeless look to him. He also had a big dark spot in the middle of his forehead. One of the officers approached me to fill me in on what's going on, before I talk to the guy and start to treat him. The officer tells me the man has a large laceration on the back of his hand that he received from a knife. At this point, I was still a bit groggy and didn't put two and two together. The officer says that the man said that he was attacked by another man and that he is probably going to need stitches. So, as it's not serious, I have my FTO approach first to begin her assessment and give me her treatment plan. I stay close behind her, and we both walk up to the man who is in handcuffs. As we approach, the dark spot on the guy's forehead is now clear. On the center of his forehead, stretching from his eyebrows, and what would have been his hairline, is the biggest swastika tattoo I've ever seen. My FTO begins to talk to the man, as I stand back and observe. Something about the man's general composure and response chilled me. When we first walk up to the man, was muttering something under his breath. I couldn't tell what he was saying, 
but he was repeating it over and over. My FTO asked the police to uncuff him to see the cut on his hand more clearly. At this point, one of the other officers produced the knife he believed to be the weapon that caused the injury. The knife was in an evidence baggie, and it was covered in blood. It was nothing special. It just looked like a cheap plastic pocket knife, like you would buy at some cheesy gift shop. It was a folding knife with a black plastic handle and a blade that was maybe three inches long with a bit of serration towards the handle. The man showed us his hand. On the back, cutting right through another large swastika tattoo, was a laceration that went from the base of his pinky finger to the lower fleshy part of his thumb. It was quite wide also, approximately three centimeters, exposing the bones of his metacarpals as well as his tendons. The bleeding had mostly stopped with pressure from the towel he was holding on to. When my partner asked the man what had happened, the man then repeated to us what he had been repeatedly muttering to himself. I killed him, man. He's dead, man. I had to have killed him. He's got to be dead. At this point, I'm starting to put it together and understanding the larger picture. We get the man into the ambulance so that we can assess for any other injuries that may not be visible under his clothing. After a thorough search, we realize that there are no other injuries, so we begin to transport him to the hospital. My FTO bandaged the man's hand, and as we were driving, I start to ask questions to try and figure out the details. The man told me everything I wanted to know, and never lost that chilling vibe, staring distantly as he recounted what happened. The man told me that he's homeless, and was wandering around when a friend offered him a ride. He says that he was leery of the man, but decided to get in anyway and accept the offer. The man said the friend began asking him if he ate it in words. The man said that he didn't and that he wasn't racist. He tells me that this is when his friend became upset with him and tried to stab him with a pocket knife. The man said that he attempted to defend himself, managed to wrestle the knife away from his friend and stabbed him back before jumping out of the car and running. So with this shocking telling of the tale, we continue to transport the man in silence. Also, as a ride note, an officer rode in the ambulance with us the whole way. After we dropped the man off at the ER, we all kind of sat there shocked leaving the hospital. We returned to the station and tried to get some sleep. However, we were not destined for sleep this night. An hour later, we get another call for a body removal from downtown, less than three blocks away from our last call. We pull up to the area which is in the middle of the street. The street itself is blocked off a hundred feet on both sides by a fire truck and police officers. The fire truck was equipped with a double stack of four halogen lights, risen up on the ladder shining down to illuminate the area. Walking up with the stretcher and body bag, the detective on scene tells us that they're done with the investigation and they are ready for us to take the body to the medical examiner's office. At this point, we're still about 50 feet away from where the body lay, from where I can see the person laying in the middle of the street. We get closer and take a few minutes to examine the body. What I see, and putting together what I was told, is astonishing to say the least. The man, another middle-aged man, appears white, possibly Mexican, lays in the middle of the street on his back, with his arms spread eagle and his legs straight. There is a vehicle parked on the side of the road, with its driver door still open. I figured that must be the guy's vehicle. It was parked neatly, not haphazardly or incorrectly. The deceased man has streaks of blood coming from his nose and mouth, with several small puncture wounds on his face and cheeks. Looking at his torso, there are about a dozen more knife-shaped puncture wounds in this chest and abdomen. Most of the wounds were so jagged and barbaric looking, you could see adipose tissue pushing out of them. There wasn't much of a blood puddle under the man, but a very large trail of blood ran from the man to the side of the street where the curb is. The blood then continues its flow another 10 feet along the curb before spilling into a storm drain. With that much blood, the man was exsanguinated and bled out there in the middle of the street. 
We packaged the man into the body bag and transported him to the ME's office. When we got back to the station, my charge medic told me the officer that rode with the first patient requested that we fill out a report on what we heard the man say. Thankfully, the rest of the shift was uneventful. Fast forward to a couple of years ago, I received a call from the state's attorney. He asked if I remembered the call to which I informed him I do. He told me that this person is going to trial for murder, is pleading not guilty, and he would like to go over my statement with me as I would be a key witness and require my testimony in court. We went over my statement and then we talked about it a bit. Then he told me he would be in touch and wished me a good day. A few days later, he calls me up again and informs me that the man changed his plea to self-defense and that I was needed in court in a week. Literally, one day before the trial, he calls me up again. He tells me this time the man changed his plea to guilty and that I was no longer needed. I don't know what happened after that. I never really looked into it. It's just another brick in the wall, so to speak. A story filed away in my brain, probably never to be forgotten. Thanks for reading, and I hope you enjoyed. This happened a few years ago. I did some work experience at a funeral home, and on one of the mornings, myself and another member of our team had to go to a mental health facility. The building was very old looking when we arrived through its gates. And when we went inside, it seemed massive. It sounded like our voices were an echo. We were there to pick up an item from someone recently deceased and were taken to a room to wait for the person in charge. It was pretty silent for a while, but then a woman appeared at the office door, opened it, came inside quickly, and then smashed the door closed again as quickly as possible. She suddenly turned to us and explained that a patient had become violent and was running around outside in the corridors. This alone was scary enough for me, but then within seconds the patient came to the door and looked through the window. She banged on the door, screaming something that I couldn't understand. A male nurse then appeared and took her away to her room as quickly as she had appeared. We then sorted out what we came for with the woman in charge and then proceeded to get up to leave. We started to walk down the corridor towards the exit, but I started to hear a noise in one of the open rooms. I looked inside and it was dark apart from a man watching TV on his own. The light from the TV was the only way that I was able to make out the outline of the man. He started mumbling something really quietly but then suddenly, out of nowhere, became really loud and started shouting. He was shouting something along the lines of, help me now, just over and over again. I was terrified and could not get to the exit quickly enough. I never had to go back there again, and I'm glad that I didn't. At the beginning of August, I overdosed on my sedatives. I was rushed to the hospital and stayed in the psychiatric session for two weeks until I was moved to another psych ward. There were many units, each had its own building, and mine was next to alcoholics, drug addicts, and some people who were there because of violating the law. Since I was in an open section of my unit, I was allowed to walk around the hospital area then, like after a week of being there, I started going to the cafeteria area to buy cigarettes and cocoa. Ever since then, one of the dudes from the alcoholics section started to hit on me, basically saying some nasty stuff, asking how old I was, etc. It was bearable at times because my roommate always called him out. But then, when I was there already for some time, he started making really creepy comments. Firstly, he asked if I was taken, to which I replied that I am, and then it started, making comments about how I broke his heart, then how he cannot stop thinking about me. Once I was discharged, I was so relieved that I wouldn't ever meet him again. 
but I also sometimes visited my friends there. And when he noticed me waiting near the cafeteria, he always came up to me, trying to touch me, asking where I live, that he'll find out where I live and that he's going to mess with me, how I broke his heart because I'm taken, and how I'm not only breaking his heart, which is bleeding, but also it breaking his spirit because he can't stop thinking about me and how every single night he once again thinks about me. One time he even tried to kiss me. This all happened in a one of the many times that I visited my friends. I don't know if it could be considered stalking or just a creepy, disgusting behavior, but because of him, I stopped visiting my friends and have been even more scared to go anywhere by myself. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.